ourselves. Um, so not taking too much time, uh, uh, I welcome you all to uh, the discussions today um, on behalf of uh, Lokniti, uh, on behalf of uh, UP Young Thinkers, um, just uh, you know, to brief uh, our viewers, uh, Uttar Pradesh Young Thinkers is just not a, a think tank. It is, it, it is a bit beyond. It is a platform where um, the opportunity uh, create ki jati hai hamare young dynamic youth ko ki wo sahi sawal uthaye, um, sahi influence or involvement rakhe un cheezon pe jo unko roz, roz maroz impact karta hai, like policy, like legal, like science. And I think um, last year has been a great example for all of us to believe that while, you know, the world and in, in India uh, battled with the unfortunate uh, pandemic, uh, it has given all of us an opportunity and a brilliant chance to showcase our true potential um, as humans, right? So, um, so I welcome uh, our guest speakers today, uh, both uh, significant disruptors in in you know in in, in their respective fields, um, both who have uh, broken barriers and uh, are continuing to make relevant changes in the society. So, um, I'll start with uh, Vijay Lakshmi ji. Um, Vijay Lakshmi ji is a Bharatanatyam artist uh, and enjoys her experience in performing arts for the last two decades, actually uh, 25 years, if, that's, if, if I've got that right. Um, you know, her involvement uh, with uh, the youth starts with uh, her experience for the past 25 years in training um, youth in, uh, as a part of Chinmaya Yuva Kendra. And um, she's been a member of Central Board of Films. Um, uh, and uh, I think uh, she has been extremely modest in hiding in her profile. And ma'am, we would want you to talk about this eventually is that she's the first woman pilot in Karnataka to do a cross country uh, flight. Um, uh, our next uh, uh, speaker today is, uh, is Ms. Charu. Uh, she shares a prol prolific experience um, and leads the way in uh, education as an educationist and a learning and development professional. Uh, more than 20 years of experience in uh, public education and learning. Um, she joined, uh, prior to joining Primus, she uh, shared great experience with KPMG and uh, organizations like ILNFS in the space of education. And I think what's even more amazing is her, her experience with working with 15, over 15 state governments. So uh, I welcome both of you today uh, on our discussion as we celebrate Inter International Women's Day. Um, and we'll start with uh, Vijay Lakshmi ji. Why don't you tell us something about your journey? Namaskar and uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, my journey, that's that's like, a, I don't know, it would be all over the map then, but uh, I thought it would be, you know, where you give me a leading question and I just answer, but anyway, that, that, nonetheless, that's okay. Uh, my journey as, um, I, I don't really like this gender bias because I think that Everybody is a human being, but uh, while we are celebrating Women's Day, because I think every day is Women's Day, uh, but since we are celebrating Women's Day today, uh, well, uh, I will just you know go with the tide and say, okay, we'll celebrate Women's Day. I uh, am the last of uh, five children, and uh, we were very involved with the Chinmaya mission. So uh, sooner or later, I started taking the classes for the Chinmaya Yuva Kendra. For uh, several decades, I took the Chinmaya Yuva Kendra. And um, I started dance uh, when I was very young. Uh, I don't dance uh, anymore. I stopped dancing quite a while ago. And, uh, but I still do deal with uh, the arts because I run a, a festival called Guriya Sambrama for the past um, 12, 13 years. We get artists from across the country to perform in uh, heritage sacred spaces. And uh, we don't stop with just uh, performances, but we normally have a theme. And uh, we have themes like uh, sacred trees, sacred animals, sacred rivers, you know, where people around get to know their own country. I'm also the director for the Center for Soft Power, which is again, like a think tank. We do a lot of work uh, dealing with India's soft power. So uh, the soft power word, I hope it will change, but anyway, Again, you know, it's just a term that we have to use. And uh, yes, when I was young, I did a lot of uh, different things. I used to play softball for the state. 
and uh, I did uh, power flying. In those days, uh, not many women were there in, uh, you know, doing flying. So when I say cross country, it doesn't mean across India. In those days, even to fly from one air base to the next was something that was unheard of. So I guess I did do, you know, I sometimes had to really have arguments with the people and said, no, no, I have to do, you have to let me go. And, but it, it wasn't that, I mean, personally, I'll tell you one thing, I've had no such bias in my life, whether it was in my family or in whatever I did, I didn't, nobody ever told me that you're a woman and you shouldn't do this. I mean, that was unheard of for me. And, uh, that's why it's difficult for me to probably understand when people say, oh, and, and I, I don't appreciate victim mode because unfortunately I find a lot of women in this victim mode. And most of the time it's uh, women, uh, you know, harassing other women. Uh, but, uh, you know, it'll always be this victim mode. Oh, they didn't let me do this. Oh, they didn't leave. Who has to let you? I mean, take charge of your life. Do what you have to do. I mean, who has to tell you what you have to do? Because it's a very easy way of hiding behind what somebody else said and, you know, say that, oh, they didn't let me do it. Okay, so they didn't let me do it. So I do whatever I want, actually, and keep giving excuses. I, I, I really don't, you know, that's something that I, I don't seem to understand. I don't think anybody else can empower me. I have to empower myself. All I can say is, you know, make the opportunities equal. That's all. And, and this whole thing of, don't call me a mother. Why shouldn't I be called a mother? What is wrong with being a mother? And, oh, I don't be tied up in a kitchen. What is wrong with cooking? I mean, I, I these are cliches that I simply don't understand. Somebody sent me a forward now. Oh, don't, don't, don't use the same terms. Don't say that you're a mother. Don't say you're behind a successful... Of course, I'm behind a successful man. If my husband was successful, it's because of me. Mm. Why shouldn't I take that credit? Why not? I mean, I think these are things that I simply don't understand. Well, I do understand that we have had, you know, our country has had 1,000 years of invasions and unsettling of whatever we were, and, you know, our culture has gone haywire. So we have had a lot of outside influences, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. But let's not live in this victim mode, you know? Mm. And for a Women's Day celebration or, you know, when they say, oh, women have to be empowered, I say it's, it's not to do with women, it's to do with society, it's to do with everybody. You need the men also speaking there. Mm -hmm. It's not just about women, women, women all the time. I mean, it has to be everybody. A society cannot run if the man is not there. I don't know why being for women seems to be against men. I have nothing against men. Well, there may be some of them who are power crazy or, you know, they, they find the same thing with the women too. So there's this whole thing of, I want a reservation. I don't want to be a reservation. I, on my own terms, I want to be who I am. I don't want you to tell me that, oh, because you're a woman, you should get a seat somewhere. No, I don't want it. If I'm fit for it, I want it. That's all. I mean, I, I don't like this whole bias of everything. Why, why, why do we need that extra? Oh, but if you want to open the car door for me, well, why not? Open the car door for me. I'm quite happy. If you want to give me a seat on the bus, yeah, sure, why not? I don't want to equate myself to a man because I, I like that whole thing. Women are from uh, Venus and men are from Mars. Why should I compare myself to someone else? I mean, you have to compare yourself to yourself and become a better you. You know, not someone else. So, and well, I also have been organizing motorsports. So, I mean, I, I didn't find it difficult at all. I mean, all the men have been really nice. I, I don't know what came over me when I suddenly wanted to start organizing motorsports. I mean, I went for one. I went for one PSD rally. And then uh, the next thing I said, I said, wait, let's do something different. I mean, all these, yeah, the, the whole thing about motorsports is pretty sometimes negative where people think that motorsports is all about, uh, you know, having fun and, you know, whatever you do at the end of it. The end of it is what they're bothered about. I said, no, I said, I I'd like to, you know, run motorsports to heritage sites. So we have organized uh, four or five motorsports. And so uh, in, in a so-called, I mean, like people would say, oh, it's all about a man thing. No, it's not. So now I'm a member of the uh, FMSCI uh, Regulatory Commission. So, I mean, 
it, it's just that you need to be confident about yourself. Somebody else cannot give you that confidence. Right. And you, you know, I, uh, I have to tell you this. I, I read a book about uh, Jansi Rani. Hmm. It was by some non-Indian author. And uh, she is our icon, right? I mean, Jansi Rani is an icon for India. But uh, in that book, it's, it's, it's written as if she's some kind of a, she had a, a British boyfriend and then she had a uh, Afghan boyfriend and then she had a fling with a Mughal prince. And I was, I was really upset. I said, I said, how could we allow this? And so I bought a whole lot of books on Jansi Rani and started reading it all. And then there was one book which was written from the view of the Durgavatis, you know, the ones who are her inner circle. Of course, it was a historical fiction, but this lady always puts the, the you know, whatever is a real fact in the book is there in the back of the book. Hmm. And so there I read this and it was that uh, Queen Victoria had passed an executive order saying that if there was a new garrison set up in any uh, town, um, two native officers and one officer could go through the town. Any woman 14 years and above in any stage could be chosen and taken to the garrison. And then they will choose, according to rank, they will choose how many and who wants whom. Then this woman will be given a war pass and there was a war keeper. And then I understood why in the same book they had written that one of the Durgavatis, her sister, who was not even 14, would not be allowed to even go near the window. She would always be in a parda. If she, if she had to go out, she would have to get into a palanquin right inside the house. She'll be carried wherever she goes. I was like upset. I said, really, was this the state in our country? When I read that executive order, I realized, I said, okay, so now I know why. Unless our youth knows these things, they are going to blame our culture for it. Our culture is not at all like that. Our culture is the one that had, you know, all these queen mothers, whether it was, I mean, I, I totally believe that uh, when you say Itihasa Purana, it's as it happened. That's what an Itihasa Purana is. In Ramayana, they did not, uh, Kausalya or Sumitra or uh, Kaikei did not go on the funeral fire with Dasharatha. And each of them had their own powers. They could, I mean, they could make or break a kingdom. So why do we have this impression? You know, these are the things that women should understand. You know, we just don't, you know, you just take it and just blame the system for everything. Right. So take charge. Yes. So, I think I've spoken for quite a bit. Now we'll. Uh, that is, uh, that is I, like I had said in the beginning of the call, true to your, uh, your uh, the background, the rich background that you share, you're, you're a real disruptor in the real sense. Uh, we'll talk to Charuji now. Charuji, we love to hear about your journey with Primus and uh, on education. Thank you, Aditi. Uh, so it was very, very inspiring, uh, uh, very exciting to hear what Vijay Lakshmi ji has just say, shared. Uh, and uh, one wasn't even aware of the last, uh, you know, the fact that uh, you shared, ma'am. And uh, we'll go and find out more. But first of all, a very big thank you for to Lokniti for uh, having us together on this. And I'm very happy to be here this evening. Uh, in terms of women empowerment, uh, you know, and we always add the word empowerment after, uh, you know, especially on an inter Women's International Day. It sounds like an entitlement, actually. Um, and uh, more than something that uh, we all of us are born with. Uh, so it, my journey, I have always worked with women uh, and men, of course, uh, my entire corporate career. But the, the whole uh, sector I work in, uh, whether it's development or whether it is working with women and child development, uh, the women are the, uh, you know, they, they, they occupy center stage. Uh, so education, we have women teachers. Um, in fact, there was a very interesting uh, study which we had researched uh, by Sandra Stackey, uh, where she had, uh, uh, you know, studied not just the cultures of, uh, I mean, the whole education system, not just here, but across, but universally, where uh, primary school teachers are largely women. 
And uh, when we look at male teachers, they occupy the uh, secondary, uh, you know, strata and higher secondary, et cetera. Uh, very few, I mean, and this is what data said. And then when I uh, went back and looked at the data, which I found from our education institutions, largely government, because around 70% of uh, our schools are government. Uh, yes, primary school teachers are largely, majority are women. Um, middle school, secondary school. So therefore I had a huge opportunity to work with women. And um, uh, yes, I totally, uh, and, and mostly I would say the women I worked with and I had a huge team, uh, you know, wherever I worked, uh, somehow I have always had a large uh, uh, team of uh, girls and women in my teams. Uh, learned a lot from them. And um, while I won't say empowered, I tried to create opportunities where uh, each of them, uh, uh, you know, access, uh, really acted and worked and performed and functioned like a leader. Uh, so um, my whole um, effort, because I've had many angels in my life, and it's not as if I, I mean, it's full of, it's also a bit of gratitude that I say this, uh, I've had some excellent, amazing experiences of working with both men and women. But Coming back to the, uh, you know, the workforce of education being women and then work with Anganwadis where in any case, all the Anganwadi uh, workers and the Sevikas, they're all women. Uh, I, I have been happy to find that uh, that whole victim, you know, uh, uh, as uh, Vijay Lakshmi ji said, thankfully that has been missing. But one thing I have definitely experienced, and this is a difference I have seen in terms of women who are working vis-a-vis -vis women who are not working. Uh, and uh, there's nothing wrong in being a housewife. In fact, uh, there is lots more work to do at home. Uh, and especially for women who work, I mean, uh, they manage both the profiles, uh, sometimes with ease and sometimes with a lot of difficulties. Uh, but one characteristic I find, and at times it just may not be just limited to women, is that whole fear. Uh, it's like, you know, imagine yourself walking into a dark room with the lights out. And what are your steps going to be? Pitch darkness. When you walk into a pitch dark room, you will take tentative steps. You know, you will not expand your space. Your arms and your limbs and your legs and arms will be more around yourself because you don't want to bump into anything. You don't know what lies ahead. If the terrain is unfamiliar, more so until you try and reach a light switch. So fear is like that, shrunken spaces, you know. And so, and several times I was amazed to see when some, when, you know, walking into a room and uh, several meetings, uh, some women just, dis, you know, chose to keep their bags on their lap. Uh, you know, you kind of keep your belongings close to you, hug them. Uh, and that whole, the whole body language betrays uh, or gives you a sense of where they are coming from. And it is this fear, it is this uncertainty, as Vijay Lakshmi ji said, confidence. Why shouldn't you have confidence? And I think building that confidence uh, is something that we can do for uh, each other, whether it's men or women. And that is something I have, uh, you know, tried to, uh, uh, we, we try and do in our work, daily work lives. Uh, so at Primus, we have around 30%, uh, you know, uh, teams who are in at all levels of seniority, etc. So while, of course, countrywide, there is 20% of participation of women, that's what we read. Uh, and here we don't go soft on women because they're women. And, uh, and the opportunities are equal. And that is something as a co-founder member of a co-founder and managing director at Primus, uh, we, we try very hard to preserve and to, uh, to nurture. Uh, but what really we, I think what the support systems that women need are, are this whole thing in terms of empowering them by, by giving them extra skills. And where there's a will, you know, uh, skills can be learned. So when we worked in, uh, in schools and this whole ICT was picking up several years back, now everybody has a smartphone, everybody is using content, is creating content, is, is doing, like you said, webinars on content. But then those days when we, uh, worked with teachers uh, to teach them technology skills because there were these, you know, government programs uh, that you had to set up ICT labs and teachers were getting trained and skilled to use I digital content and to teach with technology. The 
you should have i mean it we actually wrote a lot about it the very fact that women get the hand you know a remote uh, whether it's a tv remote or a computer or a projector and when they stand at the head of their class uh, you know, uh, beaming digital content into their classroom, teaching with con uh, with technology. And I'm not getting into the methodology, good, bad, no, just the very fact that they can use a new technology. That whole brand image kind of, you know, takes a complete jump. It's a, it's a different conversation that we have dealt with them because then they feel empowered. They feel, I mean, anybody would, you learn a new skill and especially if it's a technology skill and suddenly it's like the world opens up for them. And I think that's what uh, is needed in terms of removing these barriers, you know, and there are several entry barriers. It could be as, as simple as something reproductive health. It could be nutrition. It would be food. It could be, and, you know, uh, even how to fill up a form, language, uh, you know, of course, not just English, but even in their own vernacular, the whole communication aspect. Uh, that uncertainty of how to even start a conversation, fill up a form. We talk of women's entry into, uh, you know, uh, in in uh, uh, in enterprises. Uh, how do they even go and get a bank loan? You know, do they know how, what is a business plan? How do you make a DPR? Uh, what do they put up as collateral, even if they want to start these enterprises? Uh, so when we talk of empowering, there are several aspects that we need to sort out first. But I think more and more education, education is foundational. Um, we see these teenage pregnancies. We see child, we see marriages before. There are around, uh, if data is right, around uh, you know quarter, quarter of the female population uh, is married before 18 years. It doesn't come as a surprise or a shock to us. It's part of our culture. Uh, but that's something we need to keep girls in school for longer uh, if not if nothing else even if they don't have to go and work tomorrow but at least their bodies are not even developed so uh, you know safeguarding them from uh, teenage pregnancies and early marriage I think not just for the women but even for you know uh, uh, the generations coming forward because malnutrition we talk of malnutrition what do you expect when girls, uh, you know, uh, who themselves are malnourished or not fully formed are actually giving birth to children. So I think there are certain things that th that that should really be, you know, where, where society needs to come together and work. And since it's Lokniti, a think tank, uh, I think probably what really needs to be done also is plotting, uh, you know, by region, vulnerabilities uh, that women kind of, you know, are exposed to uh, and that is something uh, uh, which uh, uh, you know uh, would you know go large long way to kind of remove that whole victimize victimized uh, uh, you know perception women have about around themselves Bec and and what we would then achieve would be this whole currently the whole uh, uh, you know it's a very disparate uh, environment that we provide yeah. uh, some are very empowered some are of course entitled but the, the very the the you know the insidious uh, uh, the cultural social uh, aspects uh, that is something uh, uh, we need to to work around and I think Lokniti is a great uh, a, uh, you know a, a platform uh, an entity to to go about doing this. Um, uh, that's about it, I think. No, I think you um, highlighted a very important part on the aspects of empowerment and. Uh, you know, being um, being in in this whole field myself as a uh, as a founder of an organization called iLead, which works around women empowerment. Um, what we've gathered, what we've learned, is that it is not uh, it is no longer the narrative that why do women need to be empowered. I think we've progressed and reached to a point of how do we empower them. So, uh, what would you suggest? What would be the critical aspects when you're addressing or what would be the challenges when we talk about empowerment today? So let's say I'm a, uh, you know, there, there are several schemes and policies that happen in the government for, in, for, for, for supportive systems, I would say. For example, skilling. Now, uh, and this has been my personal experience when we used to do these skilling programs, of course, we, uh, we, we, had, we, we tried to, uh, you know, uh, strike a balance from very women oriented 
to disrupting and saying, yes, why can't uh, ping computing? Why can't, uh, you know, women come into technologies? Uh, in Barmer, with a particular CSR uh, program, we created a whole, I think, 120 women masons, you know, uh, uh, who were uh, with, with, with some technical skills, etc. cetera. Uh, so we try to do both and at different levels, not just at an entry level scaling. But when they go and, and this is again, we, we experienced that when we skilled them and uh, there were some placements that were found to, for them, let's say somebody working in uh, the interiors of Rajasthan came to Gurgaon and uh, they got a job. Now, where do you stay? Uh, you know, what are the support systems? So while there are working women's hostels, uh, I think more such, uh, uh, you know, safeguards, safeguarding structures in terms of their facilities, in terms of their, uh, uh, you know, how close they are to most, a lot of these metros and not just in the metros, even in, in across. I think one is we need to have a supportive ecosystem of women who are leaving because yes, let's face it, there, there may not be jobs in their local, uh, you know, in the, in the districts or wherever they are. And if they have to come out and live, that is one. The other is working women in terms of their children, uh, uh, especially nuclear families. Uh, what is the arrangements that we have for creches? Uh, and not just very, you know, privileged uh, where, but, but even across all levels can be. So while there are work creches as well, I think there needs to be more widespread uh, network in terms of uh, uh, the actual, then the safety measures in terms of uh, like fear. Uh, and I, I don't think it's a matter of empowerment. Uh, I think anybody walking a dark street or, you know, uh, you know, or uh, which is, a, will be scared or there, there's bound to be some fear factor that is involved. So while there are helplines, there, there, there are a lot of these, there are a lot of these, uh, you know, support, uh, supportive uh, provisions. I think we need to be aware of them also. So, uh, so while there is a helpline and I work with a large team of women, uh, you know, none of, you know, and, and it's a question to ask, okay, if you're leaving, then we provide you transport. Uh, but then how are you, go, do you have these uh, helpline numbers, etc. So while a lot of it is there, you know, it, it needs to be known, it needs to be probably strengthened and it needs to be used uh, for it to become better. Um, because things are only going to be maintained when there's traffic. Uh, that is one. So in that sense. And then education. Uh, and, and education is something we should not be tolerant. There should be zero tolerance for, uh, you know, uh, not for pe children, girls especially, not completing their schooling, uh, uh, you know, at least, at least for till class 10 or 12. If nothing else, it means they are in school, they are safe, and uh, as long as possible, uh, you know, we can try and provide them with, uh, with, with the skills to, uh, you know, fend for themselves later. Right. These are, these are some, uh, some there, there can be several more. Huh, the other is, of course, public toilets. Um, uh, you, you know, we, uh, last year, I think during the COVID times, because uh, it was, I mean, water and sanitation took a large hit and I was on a call, on, on a VC like this, on menstrual hygiene. And while we may talk of a lot of all this, but in terms of actually, uh, you know, how many uh, metro stations would have a toilet or public spaces have uh, uh, schools, thankfully, have a lot of toilets now because of a huge, uh, you know, um, drive that was undertaken several years back. So schools, uh, but public spaces uh, in terms of their health and hygiene. Uh, and yes, I think Vijay Lakshmi ji did bring up the, the, the men. Uh, while there are uh, all, I mean, uh, everybody is supportive, but uh, but I think more and more mothers need to have conversations with their sons, uh, and that is something uh, no state, no community can do, but homes alone. Right. So, yeah. so that so my question, same question goes to Vijay Lakshmi ji. Now, what do you feel needs to be addressed, and what are the challenges when we talk about empowering women um, in today's time? Like I already said, uh, the, that's the word that I don't really like, uh, empowering. But uh, well, like I said, you know, it has to be equal opportunity uh, with no bias and uh, support from uh, homes. And uh, I, I personally, I don't, uh, I don't really like children being um, 
left impressions. Because uh, there have been a lot of studies done that uh, if there is a separation from the primary caregiver for the first five years, the children end up with all kinds of problems in later life. So I would think that any place that women work should be giving time off to uh, mother so they don't do this uh, tight line, uh, tight rope walking where they're guilty about, you know, leaving their children or they're guilty about not working. So if we want to empower women, we have to allow them to do what they feel comfortable about. It should not be where, you know, it's like a rat race. Oh, the next door neighbor has done this, so I should be doing this. Oh, I'm at home, so people don't value me. You know, first thing, we have to value the women who stay home. Because it's a choice that a woman makes to stay home. You have to value that. You can't not value that. Because I hear so many women saying, so, okay, so what do you do? Oh, you know, I'm just a housewife. I said, why just a housewife? I said, why is that a negative thing? I said, it's a very positive thing. If you have said, I will set aside and I will sit and I will do whatever it takes, you know, to bring up my uh, children and my home and I'm enjoying it. Why do we have to look down on that? See, these are all these are all these perceptions that I think we have to change in society where you value the person for what they are doing, not measure them with some sort of a scale that you take. Oh, if she earns, uh, you know, 50 lakhs a month, she's a great person, but if she's taking care of her family, she ain't that great. That, you know, that's not a good attitude. So, you know, you know, these are things where we have to encourage people to look up to people who stand for themselves. You know, in whichever way, I, I had every opportunity to work and I said, no, I don't want to work. I said, I don't want to work outside of the house. I'll be home and I'll take care of the family. And I said, I'll spend whatever you want. And I didn't have a problem doing that. I didn't feel less about myself, but I've done a lot of things in my life. And uh, well, I recently lost my husband. So I just stepped right into his shoes uh, as the MD of the company. So, I mean, it, it's not like if you're at home, you have to be this uh, uh, person who doesn't do anything. And, you know, it, it's not like that. But if the men don't value your staying home or, you know, your family or whoever doesn't value, that it's not, everything is not about rupees and as spice. You know, uh, I should say dollars or whatever today. If it's not that, you're not worth it. Or you try to value yourself through that. It's, it's, that's when people become, you know, crazy. I, I see so many women who would, you know, feel so miserable about leaving their kids and going. You know, they like to be home with their children, but they're running because they won't be valued if they're at home. Oh, what do you know about money? You know, you're just at home. That's not a comment that should ever be made. You know, you value them for whatever they do. I mean, that's, that, that's a mindset that we have to start actually changing because whatever we have seen, you know, maybe 30, 40 years back that, you know, burn your bras and this and that and whatever kind of uh, madness of uh, feminism the West tried to pound, so, you know, force on us is not the feminism we need. Right. I, I mean, uh, I think there are uh, um, moms who run households like, uh, you know, better than management areas. They'll have so many people and, you know, she's the boss of the whole show. True. So, you know, it's, it's, it's empowering them to be themselves and not foisting on them what you think is great. Right. So I would say that looking back at our culture, I mean, if you look at Ardhana Rishwara, what is it? Hmm. you know unless both are there society is not going to work there has to be prakriti and there has to be purusha but you know we have all this i mean we, we we should learn to look at our culture from our own eyes not from the eyes of an outsider because right now most of the time we're looking at our country and our culture from the eyes of an outsider and because of that we have a lot of problems we have a lot of issues and, you know, we, we, we want to ape something that's really not ours. I mean, we have so many. I mean, even like, for example, I remember when we, oh, don't be a Sati Savitri. I said, why do you make Savitri appear like a negative person? Savitri was a woman who could give life to her husband. Why is it negative? She said, I'll marry this, uh, 
this man, even if he is going to die, it doesn't matter. I know how to deal with it. Mm. So, you know, I mean, we, we have so many examples of women who are absolutely powerful. Even our queens. I mean, if you look at uh, Rani Abaka or Jansi Rani or any of them. But instead, we'll choose, we will choose to look at, I'm not saying that we don't have issues. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that there aren't women who are, uh, you know, not taken care of. Or are, but, you know, what I'm saying is let's not go into this victim mode of, you know, thinking that anything to do with nurturing is wrong. Because I, I hear this too much with the next generation. Sometimes I wonder, is it my age or is it wisdom? I, I don't know what it is. But it, it really pains me when, you know, oh, I don't want to have any children. Oh, children are painful. Hello, you were a child one day. So were you a pain? It's not that they are actually wanting to say that, but they're trying to fit into this role, which they think is cool. Yeah, yeah. No, it's cool to say, I hate cooking. It's cool to say, oh, you know, I don't want children. It's cool to say, oh, I don't want to get married. But if that's really what you want, that's okay. But that's not what many of them really want, but they're trying to fit into these, you know, these uh, uh, little slots that they create for themselves. Somebody asked me once, oh, uh, uh, don't you want to do what, you know, some man, I said, no, I don't want to do what a man does. Why should I do what a man does? I'll do what I want to do. Oh, it was about, uh, what is this? Um, uh, you know, in the Rotary Club before, they didn't allow, uh, they didn't have women Rotarians. They could only be a, uh, I said, well, let's start, start your own. Or the Masonic Lodge. I said, start your own. Why do you need to compete with them? We don't need to compete with anybody. Do your own thing. Why do we need to compete? Oh, if a man is a jet fighter pilot, I have to be one. No, I want to be a jet fighter pilot, so I want to be one. Not because a man is a jet fighter pilot. You know, that's the, that's the mode of thinking we have to get out of. There's no competition here. A society is made of men and women. Right. A society cannot go forward with only women or with only men. There has to be a balance of it all. So I hope that answered what you were looking for. It indeed did. Uh, that brings me to my next question of um, when we reflect uh, to the past year, I think we've seen that uh, um, uh, women have established themselves in the leaders in terms of battle with the pandemic, you know, whether it was as caregivers, whether it was health, medicine, um, setting up work from home, um, corporate environments. I think we women have um, have been great achievers in, uh, in showing that when it comes to crisis, we can do wonders. Having said that, you know, there is also a data in front of me which says, according to UN, that 44% um, women uh, were made were you know made to leave their jobs in the especially in the inf uh, informal uh, economic sector uh, as compared to uh, thirty percent men. So it is that reality also that one is battling with. So when we talk about uh, women being integral parts of our you know boosting. It's a tough one. I think it? that's more of a question for Charu than for me. Charu, would you like to answer that? See, I think we'll encounter... Uh, uh, see, okay. I don't think anybody, why just men? Anybody will yield space voluntarily. You know, it's in... Uh, it's it's a it's in human nature to uh, uh, to preserve uh, you know your uh, for, for for preservation, but uh, yes, I have seen that uh, this side also uh, during the uh, course of my work experience that uh, men will not, not yield space, and uh, then it is up to you. So it is survival of the fittest, yes, and then it depends on each woman how and her choice how she wants to uh, you know. Uh, to deal with it uh, so at times i have just chosen to and i, I have also experienced uh, several uh, uh, you know um, situations uh, so i think it's all on a on a person basis it's on a situation basis at times i have decided no 
I will not, uh, I will not, uh, you know, I will stick to my, because I believed in something and I stuck to it. At times it doesn't really matter, you know, okay. It happens on a, uh, you know, you will find people who will get into an argument, who will uh, get stuck on some, so it's okay, each to his own. But um, actually there are, we have several others also on the, you know, on this, and it would be interesting to hear their views as well. I don't know, Aditi, I'm not interfering with your flow, but uh, there are. Uh, yes, so, so uh, you know, the, the format is that we will uh, leave uh, the last few minutes uh, to uh, to our participants if they want to add or if they want would like to um, give in their uh, two cents on uh, empowerment uh, right. empowerment uh, and that also be your key advice uh, to women on their way or on their route towards empowerment I'll start with you, Charu. Uh, so I would uh, say definitely, uh, you know, preserve your dignity. Uh, go for what you want. Uh, if you have the opportunity to fulfill a dream, uh, not everybody has the, uh, you know, not everybody can fulfill a dream. Uh, several people don't know what their dream is. I discovered my passion, my calling for life as I moved through uh, my own experiences. Uh, and each five years was a very different, I mean, in terms of, uh, uh, but those who can create opportunities for themselves. And, and why should we always expect uh, the community, the society, uh, when we compete, when we compete in a classroom, when we compete in a college, we compete in the working world, uh, we are competing. And uh, a boy or a male out there has uh, a pride in our work, uh, intellectual integrity. Must, uh, must, must learn to compete and not expect for free. give him everything um, you know if you're sitting in your home you won't get a plumber but you will curse the government that my uh, the tap is leaking in my bathroom uh, so I think for, we need to um, uh, I have always worked very hard in my so when men can go out and uh, you know uh, uh, you know pave their own uh, path through in life There may be biases. Um, I wouldn't. Say you uh, definitely would say you create, develop your own capacities. Please don't crave for something just because you're a woman. Uh, we are different. I mean, Ma'am said, Ardhana Arishwar, definitely. And uh, I'm happy being a woman, uh, you know. And just because a woman can be compassionate, it can't mean that a man can't be compassionate. Uh, and uh, like vice versa, women are strong, they are compassionate. She's a natural caregiver. She gives birth. Uh, I mean, nature has selected her to, you know, go through this process. Uh, I'm very happy that I, uh, you know, uh, had the privilege of bearing two sons and uh, who are as compassionate as uh, I expect, uh, you know, any daughter would be. Speak with my teens, uh, with, the, with my friends, with my family. Vijay let's hear from you. I would say that um, the most important thing is to uh, compete not with others, but with yourself. Become a better you each day. Do better at what you are doing. And uh, start looking at yourself a lot. I don't mean, you know, the mirror. I mean, that also you can do nothing wrong with that. But, uh, you know, 
it's it's very important for us to know what our individual journeys are. It really doesn't have much to do with all the external world. Not that the external world is not important, but uh, each of us, you know, creates our own world. Finally, it's each of us creates our own world. Uh, we have to go on this journey where we look at ourselves, look at our thoughts, and uh, stop the blame game. Like she said, you know, the water doesn't come in your tap. You're talking about the government. You know, we had this experience where we did some work in a village and uh, then the panchayat had uh, the gutters, uh, you know, new gutters installed and everything cleaned up. And um, he gave all the villagers, we said, we will provide you with whitewash because that village, everybody had whitewashed at that time. And we said, uh, we will give you a large amount for the cleanest house and the prettiest house. So we gave them colors also because many of them do very nice rangoli, the men, women, everybody does. So we had the architects come and you know we divided the village into four uh, sections so that they can do it. And they, you know, they really did a very nice job. And um, a few months later, I was driving in and I saw a clogged gutter. And I said, why is this clogged here? Immediately, the immediate answer was government has to clean it. I said, but uh, didn't they put the, you know, the gutters for you? I said, all that mess is from your house. Don't you have to clean it? No, no, it's in the gutter. How can I clean it? I said, but it's from your house. So the government has to do it. So, you know, it became the government's responsibility to come and clear the trash that you threw out into the gutter instead of into a trash can. So it's, you know, we, we have this habit of, you know, blaming everybody. And yes, the SOPs have to stop. We have too many SOPs in our country. If you travel into villages, you will find a lot of them sitting around doing no work because they get, uh, you know, they get money for doing nothing. Claiming that, uh, you know, they have worked hard. I mean, they didn't get a job. And the next thing, I mean, this is going to be really upsetting to a lot of people. Constantly talk about uh, education for all. I think that education should be given to those, the kind of education that we give in schools today, I mean, that kind of education, should be given to those who are capable of that kind of education. Each man has, each person, see, nobody, we, we, we tend to slot people. Because I went to this hall, we had a group of us who went to the village to, oh, we have to teach everybody. And here we come across eight standard children who couldn't add, they couldn't subtract, they couldn't multiply. Then I asked the teachers, I said, what's going on? Don't they have a math teacher? No, 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 you know, we are not allowed to fail the children till they come to eight. I said, and then what happens to them? Oh, and then we can fail them. I said, so you make this whole set of people feeling like they're failures. Why? Because they didn't know how to go through education the way you wanted them to go through. In fact, a couple of those women, you know, the, the girls in the village were very good at embroidery. They couldn't get through school. I said, come, I'll teach you embroidery. And they were very good at, uh, you know, rangoli. I said, I don't want to teach you cross stitch. You do your rangoli, that's fine. Do your rangoli. You, you know, now one of them, you know, stitches and she's very happy. She said, you know, I'm so happy that you didn't, you know, I wasn't forced to do what I did. She said, oh, they treat me badly because my sister passed PUC and I couldn't. Well, everybody cannot pass PUC. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. You're a wonderful person. You do beautiful rangoli. You're a nurturer. You do a lot of good things. So this whole thing of slotting people has to stop. You know, we cannot make this, you know, we, we have a fear at the world across, I see this whole thing, a fear of diversity. We don't have a fear of diversity. We are a diverse people. Why do we have? We have a million languages. I say, hey, that's a great thing. It's a great thing we are diverse. It would be so boring. I mean, when I go to the US, it's boring. The whole, everything looks the same to me. 
You go from one city to the next, it's all the same. But for us, you go from one street to the next, everything is different. I mean, everybody has their own homes. Why are we afraid of diversity? Why do we need to standardize everything? Our systems are also very individualized. Ayurveda is very individualized. There's no one shoe fits all. Okay, you're, you're 18 years and uh, this is your height, so this should be your weight and this is what it has to be. No, it doesn't have to be. See, that's what I mean. You know, you, these biases, these slots, and this looking at ourselves from outside eyes, that, that's something that I, I think we should stop. We have to be our own person. Do your own thing. I'm an Indian. I like it this way. So what? Absolutely. I think I, I, I like wearing a sari. So what? I'm not backward because I wear a sari. I'm not backward because I have a bindi. So, so I'm happy doing this. I mean, I went to work in the US and uh, they, they called me excitedly and said, oh, we've got, you know, you've got the job. I said, well, I need to come and talk to you because you may want to give me a job, but I may not want your job if you don't, you know, if you don't fulfill what I want. I said, I'll come dress the way I am. I said, oh, it's fine. I said, oh, thank you, because, you know, I don't want to fit into your slot of wearing only gray, blue, white, whatever, you know, three and a half colors. I said, we are colorful people. You know, we, we dress in all colors. That's why I object to it, you know, when, when you go to many of the, you know, like there was a BMW dealership and uh, this uh, girl who was you know, pretty buxom and whatever, you know, she was very embarrassed to wear the clothes she was wearing. She was wearing this uh, ridiculous tight pant and the shirt. And after some time, I couldn't bear it. I asked her, I said, uh, is this your uniform? Yes, ma'am. I said, did you not object to it? I said, do you like it? No, I don't. I said, why don't you tell them what you like? I said, well, they're selling cars in our country. They are the ones buying the cars. So why do you need, why is it formal becomes, you know, a gray, black, something like that? I said, I'm an Indian, I dress in colors, I dress the way I am. This is formal for me. So you don't need to tell me what I have to wear. So this is what I mean. I mean, we have to learn to be confident of ourselves and know how to speak up. So that's what I would say, you know, learn to speak up for yourself. Don't play the blame game. Right, I think that's so fabulously put and, and that is what the sense of this discussion has been that empowerment begins not by somebody teaching you, but by taking a stand for the values that you stand for, right? You need to respect that. Um, uh, you know, time is less. Uh, of course, we'd want to ask more questions, but let me, um, let me ask the audiences if there's anything that they would want to ask, if there's anything that they would want to add, the floor is yours. You'll have to uh, unmute yourself and ask a question if there's any input or anything that you'd like to ask. I think I think the men are frightened. There are too many women here. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Vijayalakshmi Ji and Charuji, for taking up the time and uh, sharing your journey and truly inspiring us um, and, and the youth on uh, what the way forward is. Uh, thank you so much. Also, um, thank you to Lokmiti. Thank you to um, Satender Ji to uh, of being kind and organizing this. He's, I think he's online. Let, let's hear it from you, Satender Bhai. Two words from you. No, uh, thank you very much for coming. Actually, uh, when I was thinking about this program, uh, my whole idea was the same. Keep uh, whatever uh, women are, they must pride of that. वो जो part एक चल रहा है narrative across the world कि अगर वो बहुत empowered है तभी उसको देखा जाता है. That mean terms in uh, in terms of economy and other uh, powers. But जो मात्र शक्ति का India के अंदर जो idea था वो हमेशा से powerful रहा है. If you go uh, with the lens of Sita. तो सीता के पास इतना पावर था कि वो 14 से 15 किंग्स को आ, मतलब रिजेक्ट करने के बाद देन उन्होंने राम को पिक किया तो ये पावर दिखाता है कि उमेन हमेशा से पावरफुल रही है इंडिया के अंदर ये इंडिया की जो आ, आ, जो इंडिया का दर्शन रहा है वो हमेशा से पावर देता रहा है
तो वो जो आइडिया आज के समय लोग इंडियन सोसाइटी के के ऊपर पोज करने की कोशिश करते हैं कि वुमेन तभी इम्पावर होगी जब इकोनॉमिक पावर हो जाएगा जैसा बहुत अच्छा एग्जाम्पल दिया कि लक्ष्मी लक्ष्मी बाई वॉज देयर और भी बहुत सी बहुत महिला किंग्स थी जिन्होंने पूरे स्टेट्स को रूल किया और ये रूल एज ए रूल की तरह नहीं पावर की तरह नहीं बट एज ए सोसाइटी और अपनी फैमिली की तरह जिसको उन्होंने डेवलप किया तो वो जो विजन है वो जो इंडियन सोच है जो निकलनी चाहिए बाहर रिफ्लेक्ट होनी चाहिए दैट हैज टू बी देयर और वुमेन एम्पावरमेंट को उस लेंस से देखने का प्रयास भारत दिख करता है और उसी में हमें आगे बढ़ना है और मुझे लगता है कि ये जो सेशन आज हुआ ये कहीं ना कहीं उस पूरे नरेटिव को बदलने का कोशिश करेगा और जो पुरुष उसको देखना चाहता है वो उस जो लेंस आजकल दिखने लगा है वो उसको भी बदल उस उस लेंस को भी बदलेगा और डेफिनेटली इट विल हेल्प टू यू नो लार्जर एट लार्जर पॉइंट पे और एक बार फिर से धन्यवाद थैंक यू वेरी मच विजय मैम फॉर टेकिंग टाइम वेरी शॉर्ट नोटिस पे मैंने आपको इन्वाइट किया था एंड इवन चारू थैंक यू वेरी मच Thank you and namaskar. Thank you. Namaskar. Namaskar. Namaskar.